again. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, this truly is a, a special Sunday. Uh, we are uh, discussing uh, life. We're discussing the, the beauty of life. And honestly, I, I just ask that, that you would pray for me during this time. Uh, this sermon, it, it's a hard one in that we're examining the hottest of hot-button issues uh, and I get fearful with that sometimes. It's hard wading out into these. Uh, so just so you know, it's right at the outset of this, uh, we're going to be walking into some ideas and thoughts that, that may make you feel a bit uncomfortable or challenge our presuppositions, and that's okay. Um, so just know that right at the outset, I want you to know that no matter if, if you're a member or if this is your first Sunday here, I, I want you to know that you are loved and there is grace and mercy found with Jesus. So right at the outset of this conversation, I want you to know that. And so my goal this morning, I want to speak to both sides of this issue, the issue of abortion, the, the horror that is abortion. I want to talk to both sides of it. And, and I, what I want to attempt is that, attempt to challenge and comfort those both on the left and the right. On either side of the issue, I would like us to be challenged this morning uh, and encouraged with the goal being that we could meet in the middle where Jesus is. Does that sound good? Does that sound like a good goal this morning? Um, we could meet with Jesus this morning and right where the Bible would take us. So would you pray for me, uh, with me, and then we will jump in. Uh, Father, we come into your presence this morning. Father, we, we live in the midst of, of a crooked, broken world. We live in a world so marred by its sinfulness. It is a shame that we would even have to have a day set aside to discuss uh, the, the murder of babies. But with that, Lord, we also know that we live in a world full of people with souls whom you love. And so this morning, Lord, would you teach us to be angry at the things you're angry at, but also teach us to be great lovers of people as well. Father, would you take over this morning? May this morning not be about any of our wisdom, but may it be wisdom from you and wisdom from your word. And would it teach us and show us and drive us uh, to minister and share the gospel with our world. Lord, we love you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And um, so one of the things a couple weeks ago, uh, one of the things leading up to this service, last week uh, we were supposed to show a little video uh, to kind of as a primer for this Sunday. We were going to show a Sanctity of Life video, uh, and we were going to just say, hey, next week we have Sanctity of Life Sunday. Uh, in the hustle and bustle of creating a new order of service, we forgot to show it. <laughs> but one of the things that came up with trying to find a video, and it's something Andre and I talked about a bit, was it was so hard to find a video, a pro-life video, that wasn't negative or overly politicized. It was so difficult to find a video in support of pro-life from a biblical perspective that wasn't horrific and it wasn't just spewing the numbers and, and, and pushing for a political position. It was really hard to find one. And it got me thinking that I think for us, as we engage the issue of life, we engage the issue of abortion, we need to realize there's much deeper issues occurring behind the scenes and beneath the issue of abortion itself. I could, I could give you the numbers, but what I'm convinced of, and I think some of the numbers are helpful, but we know the negativity of it. We know the horror of it. We know it. And I'm wondering if the negativity actually helps at all. And I, and I was thinking this week, you know, is, is the Christian pro-life ethic, is it merely a political position? Is that all it is? Is the pro-life movement as we know it is, it, is it working? Are the small gains that we're seeing winning the war? Or maybe, is it possible that we've, we've in a sense, we've prostituted ourselves on the altar of political power and we've left our biblical foundations and morals. 
It seems to me that as we're in this culture that is increasingly hostile towards Christianity, that we live in a culture where it is okay to murder babies. We live in that type of a world, and yet we've contented ourselves as a church and as Christians with mere political engagement without actually addressing the real issue, that being the gospel of Jesus and the salvation of people's souls. That's one of the reasons I love CareNet. CareNet's a weird little agency in the midst of the pro-life movement that cares for the real issue, the soul, the gospel, that which will break the chain and the problem and the horrendous issue that is abortion. And, and I find it so fascinating that in our modern moment, that instead of buying into the gospel, instead of buying into scripture, instead of buying into setting our face firmly to the kingdom, that we've tended to just buy into the belief that politics will usher in the change that we need. I think it's interesting that the great Billy Graham, in 2011, he gave an interview, and in this quote, this is towards the end of his life, and Billy Graham said this, and he's reflecting over his life, and he was asked about some things that he did right, and maybe some things that he did wrong. And Billy said this, he said, I also would have steered clear of politics. I'm grateful for the opportunity that God gave me to minister to people in high places. But looking back now, I know I sometimes cross the line and I wouldn't do that again. I think Billy is hitting on some real truth in that. That what happens is when the Christian, when we lose sight of the gospel as the chief issue, we lose the war. We may win Supreme Court seats, we may pass some legislation. They're small battles, but we ultimately, voluntarily lose the war. So my question this morning is, how are we to biblically respond and to address the issue of abortion? Not how are we to do it politically, but how are we to do it biblically? What is the Bible's understanding of humanity and life? What is the Bible's ethic of engagement of these type of issues? How are we to engage those we fundamentally disagree with? How are we to engage the, the women and men that are affected by abortion? How are we to engage them? How do we do it? And, and imagine, you know, imagine that a young man or a woman who is either seeking out or has already had an abortion stepping foot into our church. And if the statistics hold, that has probably happened. And if the statistic holds, we may have some present this morning. What do we offer them? Do we just offer bumper stickers that just reminds them that they're terrible? Do we just offer them protest signs that calls them a murderer? What do we offer them? If the statistics do hold, we, we know roughly there are 13.5 abortions per 1,000 women. Friends, let that hit you. That's horrific. That's 13.5 abortions per 1,000 women. That's per the latest CDC numbers. And put that in line with our population of Randolph. There are roughly 14 abortions per year, statistically, in the Randolph community alone. Kind of makes your heart check a bit, doesn't it? That's 14. One in four women will have an abortion by age 44. That's roughly 250 women in the Randolph community alone. Let that hit you. 250. We know 75% of abortions are done because of poverty. 16.4% of the population of Randolph lives below the poverty line. And check this, in Randolph, the largest percentage of individuals living in poverty are women ages 18 to 24. Let that hit you. How are we engaging these women? How are we engaging these men? What are we doing to minister to them and care for them? I mean, maybe we, we've settled to engage them at a distance through political gain. Maybe we've settled to, to protest in March and, and we engage them again politically, but we never meet their needs. And I know this is an uncomfortable topic and a really hard truth 
to say, but even if, and we pray for the day that Roe v. Wade is overturned, but we do know that if Roe v. Wade is overturned, people still need the gospel, right? That's, that's a powerful thought. And even if we win politically, don't we know that people still need the gospel? That the people that are championing for abortion are still people with real souls desperately in need of Jesus. Do we believe that? It's a hard truth. And we know that abortion and murder, we know it's, it's, it's nothing new. We, we look to the Bible, and the Bible is full of it. The Bible, we see people sacrificing their children to mold it. We see the Pharaoh in Exodus killing newborn baby boys. We see King Herod losing his mind in Matthew 2 and butchering children. And, and what we discover in the Bible is that when we're willing to see beyond the political fray, we see what is truly happening with abortion. And we see it for what it is. It is a spiritual and demonic blindness that is oppressing people. That it's a spiritual and demonic blindness that is oppressing people. And catch this, there is no amount of conservative resurgence that can push the demonic forces of darkness that are oppressing people. There's no political power that can do that. You know what does that? The blood of Jesus. That's what does that. Politics can't break the chain, but Jesus can. Jesus can. Jesus can. And he does. And there's no other force powerful enough to defend the life of the unborn, to fight for the care and the nurture of women, to love and nurture children, other than the gospel of Jesus. That's the answer. So what are we to do? How are we to engage? What does the Bible say? And that's what I want to look at this morning. So I want to do this in two parts. The, the first is, let's get a biblical understanding of what life is. Why is life important? That's a good question to ask. What is the biblical ethic of life? If you're taking notes, that's the first point. The biblical ethic of life. What does the Bible say about life? And, and friends, we need to think Christianly about this, not just conservatively about this. We need to think Christianly about this. What does the Bible say about life? What is the biblical ethic of life? And number two, so the first is the biblical ethic of life, and the second point this morning is this, the biblical ethic of engagement. How are we to engage? Christianly, how are we to engage? And we're going to find, as we get into it this morning, that we must engage as Jesus engaged, not just as the political flavor of the month engages. We need to ask ourselves, how would Jesus engage? How does Jesus engage? How does Jesus minister to people? So here we go. So the first point, the biblical ethic of life. What, big question, are you ready? What is life? What is life? That's a deep question. <laughs> Philosophers, an alchemist, theologian, scientist, everybody's been clamoring to answer this question since the dawn of humanity. What is life? Why is life important? Why am I here? We ask ourselves this in the face of the abortion. Horror. What is life? What makes abortion so wrong? What is it about human life? Everybody wants to know. Everyone's asking that question. And you know what's great? You know what's awesome? God tells us. He gave us his word. As is common, almost every time you have a question, you're trying to understand what's wrong with the world, trying to make sense of situations, God gave us the answers. They're here. So we turn here. If you would open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. And this is the easiest. If you've never picked up a Bible before, it's the first book in the Bible. It's super easy. You just... Flip it over. And in some Bibles, Genesis chapter 1, it's like the first page of the first book. Really easy. Genesis chapter 1. As we look to this question, what is life? We're going to read a pretty expansive, we're going to read the chapter this morning. 
So I want us to get a feel for and the flow of the text of what the author, Moses, is doing here in Genesis 1. So in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1, the author writes, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day. The darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Verse 11, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit, and which is their seed, each according to its kind. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit in which their seed was, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures. And every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God said that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. And over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant 
yielding seed that is on the face of the earth. And every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. It's a very common chapter in the Bible, right? We've probably read that chapter umpteen times. Very familiar, right? We know the creation story. We, we have posters of the creation story in kids' rooms. We, we know this. And yet it's so easy as something that becomes known can kind of become cliche, and we kind of lose what's interesting about it. Something powerful happens in Genesis 1. In verses 1 through 25, you, you get this rhythm, you get this poetic feel to the verses. If you read it, and read it on your own this week, you'll see the, the, re, the repeating frame, and God said, and God said, and God said, and there was, and there was, and there was. There's a rhythm, there's a poetry to it. But all of it changes in verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 1 through 25, there's rhythm, there's a flow, there's, there's a seeming bit of music to it. And verse 26, it all changes. There's this drastic shift in the pace of the text. A total break in the pentameter in the text. Uh, one of my favorite movies is The Last of the Mohicans. Anybody ever see that movie? I think it was 92, 93. Uh, if you are feeling like, I don't know, if you're a man and you're just feeling kind of discouraged, watch Last of the Mohicans and you're going to be running around with your shirt off, taking on the world. Alan knows what I'm talking about. It'll fire you up. And one of the things I love about the Last of the Mohicans is the music. Not only are the action scenes great, but the music. I, I encourage you, go to YouTube. I'm not encouraging you to bootleg music, but it's on YouTube. This is the last Mohican soundtrack. It's fantastic. And the song that I love the most is the main theme song. And, and here's why. The, the song begins, and there's this gentle roll of drums in the background. Sounds like a war drum, but very subtle. And then it, it picks the fiddle, and, and the rhythm kind of picks up a little bit, and it's moving ever so slowly along. It's rolling along like a river. You're kind of getting excited. You're, you're wondering what's going to happen. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, the symphony explodes in this song. And you're just overwhelmed as you hear it. That's how Genesis 1 reads. We read Genesis 1, verses 1 through 25. There's this gentle roll of drums and fiddle. That it's, it's just repetitive, and it's repeating, and it seems to be flowing along. And we read verse 26 through 31, and there's this explosion of a symphony. It's as if verses 26 through 31 were that which the whole first 25 verses were putting our attention to. It rolls along. And we see it in verse 26. That the author writes, Then God said, Notice it's a bit different. If you look at the other verses in chapter 1, there's this bit of, and God said, that is said. And God said. And God said. Verse 26 begins with this statement of enticement, this word of then. It's as if the author is like, on top of all of this greatness, then God did this. It's wild what happens in verse 26. It's almost as if the author is saying, you wouldn't believe it. That, that God created all these magnificent things, all the streams, the wolves, the clouds, elks, doggies, kitties, they're all there. It's great. It's wonderful. Then. It almost denotes like, Tim, you'll like this, it like denotes the holy smokeness of it. It's like, holy smokes, look at this. God does something special. And what does he do in verse 26? Then God said, let us make man in our image. Powerful words here. Powerful words. Notice, if you will, this is for your own personal study, the, the idea of let us. We have the trinity right here in Genesis 1.26. The triune nature of God right here. 
But for, for our reasons this morning, notice God says, let us make man in our image. It means this special care and concern for that which is about to be created. Something special is about to happen. <clears throat> Everything that was crafted and constructed before this was simply done by God speaking, and it came into existence. God had a plan, and he spoke, and it just came into existence. Notice the difference in verse 26, though. Humanity is crafted, in it, and it's constructed by God like everything else, but with one noticeable difference. You know what the difference is? The pattern that was used. Every other pattern throughout the other five days was all something new. There never was a tree before. God made a new plan. Boom, here's a new blueprint. Tree. God said water. Well, new blueprints. Here's water. Bam. Verse 26. Man isn't made with new blueprints or new plan. That the pattern used to create mankind was not you. It was God himself. God said, I'm going to copy myself. I'm the blueprint for what I want to create. And God himself takes extra special attention and care in creating humanity. And we see here in verse 26 that humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. That humanity was created to represent. That's what it means to be the image of. It was rep created to represent God. And that humanity was to act like God. That's what it means to be created in the likeness of God. And it goes on in verse 26. Not only does God say, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, he says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven. Humanity was created as separate from and in charge of the rest of the created order. You see that there? This denotes the Lord's special affinity for this new being. This new being, humanity, was no mere animal. They weren't a creature like the other animals. They're special amongst the entirety of the order. It's different and it's unique, and nothing else even comes close to humanity. God creates fish, he creates birds, he creates livestock, and never takes the special attention to stop and pause and bring attention to it. Humanity is fundamentally different. So here's what we learn in verse 20, in Genesis 1, verse 26, regarding humanity and trying to develop a biblical ethic for why human life is so important. We, we learn this, number one, that mankind is special. It's special. This is a special feature of creation. Number two, we learn that mankind is unique. This is fundamentally different than anything else in creation. The, the third thing we learn is mankind is separated from the created order. It's not equal. It's not one of the other monkeys. He's different. There's something different about him. And that mankind has the Lord's affection. We're going to get to that in a moment. And we also see that mankind is the pinnacle of creation. If you notice in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, where God, all the other verses at the end of the day, God would say, and it was good, and it was good. In verse 31, God finally says, who said it? Very it's very good. You want to know why that is? You want to know why that is? It's because the mankind is viewed as this cherry on top of the ice cream of creation. That's what it was. And it was good. It was great. God was doing good things. And then he created man and woman in his image and likeness. And God finally surveys all that he created and said, this is really good. Really good. This is awesome. So God says. So God says. So what does that mean for us today? So humanity is special. Okay? So that means that every man, woman, and child, every race, every age, every religious or irreligious expression, they people are special. Special. No matter age, no matter how young, no matter how old. No matter how astute or if there's developmental disabilities, no matter what, across the, the spectrum of humanity, every single human being, every life is special. Number two, every human is unique. That humanity is unique. That every human is instilled with a divine spark 
that is the signature of God's creation of them. That's a powerful thought. A very common passage of scripture that comes up uh, in the pro-life conversations is Psalm 139. And Psalm 139 illustrates this point perfectly. In Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, we read this. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. And God's a way better knitter than me. You should ask Kirsten, one time I tried to be a knitter. Let me tell you how that came out. God's a good knitter. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Skip down to verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Psalm 139 is powerful, and it's obviously a poetic expression. We, we know where babies come from. I assume. We, we know the biology behind where babies come from. But what Psalm 139 does for us is it expresses poetically the spiritual reality beyond, be, behind the biology of birthing a child. That God is guiding it sovereignly and behind it and directing the creation of every human life. It's unique. Extremely unique. From the moment of conception, there is a soul that is birthed. The immaterial nature of the soul is coupled with the material body of a child in an instant. Unique. Very interesting. Not only is humanity special, not only is humanity unique, we also know from Genesis 126 that humanity is separate from the created order. That human life, that a baby, that an infant, that a newborn is not a collection of cells or a lump of tissue. They're not just a, we tend to give them medical words like, well, it's a fetus. I, I had a friend I talked to one time, and I asked him, I was talking to him about he and his wife, he just found out they're pregnant and they're excited to have a baby. And he told me, it's not a baby yet, it's just a fetus. I said, it, it's a life. We learn from Genesis 1.26 that it's separate from the created order. It's a person. It's not to be bought and sold as beef and pork. That's horrific nature. That's what's so crazy about the selling of baby body parts. That's what's crazy about prostitution, pornography, sex trafficking, all of it, is, is we, we lessen the uniqueness of humanity. We equate them to animals. God's word says no. They're not to be slaughtered like the animals. They're not to be made equal with the animals. That's what drives me nuts when I hear people say with their dog, this is my fur baby. It's not a baby. You can eat that thing in another country. It's different. Humanity is so separate from the created order. <clears throat> Humanity has the Lord's affection, we see in Genesis chapter 1. We, we know in Genesis 3, we find this horrific account after Eve and Adam had eaten of the fruit. We get this encounter of God in Genesis 3, and put this in your notes, Genesis 3, 8 through 13. Don't read this. There's this fascinating account of the Lord walking in the garden. And he's walking in the garden, and, and the Lord asks, where are you, Adam and Eve? Their, their relationship was fractured, and you can feel the depth of relationship that had existed between God and man in Genesis 3. That it hurt God. He loved them. The, the, the fall and the subsequent sacrifice of Jesus displayed this. What do you think John 3.16 means? What is this for God so loved the world? It means he so loves humanity. He didn't say that about the cows. He didn't say that about the fish. He didn't say that. And lastly, number five, that humanity is the pinnacle of creation. Man, let me tell you, canyons, peaks, valleys, all the beauty of the natural order pale in comparison to you and me and babies and humanity. 
We think asteroids and planets are cool, and then you the biggest, coolest things created. No, you are. Babies are the pinnacle of creation. So back to our question, what is the biblical ethic of humanity? How are we to view humanity? This is where it gets difficult. It may be hard for some to swallow, but, but hear me clearly that the Bible clearly presents a pro-life ethic that is rooted in the special nature of humanity. Clearly. Clearly. The Bible clearly presents so beautifully the uniqueness of humanity and condemns vehemently the destruction of life. Vehemently so. And so that's why it's one of the Ten Commandments. That's why the destruction of human life, regardless of age, is murder. Murder. The Bible clearly defends the life of the unborn within the womb. We know that. But here's the rub. Here's the rub. The Bible is consistently pro-life. Here's what I mean by that. That the Bible's view of pro-life certainly begins with the unborn, but it doesn't stay there. The, the Bible's presentation of pro-life has as much to say about the protection of babies in the womb as it does for the care for the poor, the refugee, the broken, those with special developmental needs, the elderly. The whole spectrum of humanity. The Bible defends the unborn. We see that in Psalm 139. The Bible defends children. We see that in Matthew 18, where Jesus says, if you harm a child, they'll basically choke you out at the bottom of the sea. That's what he said. I'll tie a millstone around your neck and toss you into the water. Defends vehemently the life of children. All throughout Scripture, the life and defending the life of the elderly. This is where the modern pro-life movement is cutting its legs out from under itself. When we reduce pro-life just to mean anti-abortion, we cut the legs out from the biblical ethic of life. To be certain, the biblical pro-life ethic begins with the unborn, but it's so much more. The Bible presents to counter the modern and politicized pro-life movement, a consistent pro-life position that protects and champions all of humanity, all of life. It's so powerful, it's so big, that the biblical pro-life position is not only anti-abortion, but pro-abundant life. The biblical position of pro-life is that it's pro-family, it's pro-full bellies, it's pro-education, it's pro-care for the least of those. It's pro-healing, it's pro-foster care, it's pro-adoption, it's pro-lifting people out of poverty. It protects the vulnerable among us. Man, imagine if we had the same energy that's expressed through protest marches and we directed it towards those in our own community. The, the biblical pro-life ethic is so profound and that it's rooted in something much bigger than politics. It's rooted in the gospel of Jesus, who himself is, John 1, 4, the fount of life, who is the life, John 14, 6, who is the giver of abundant life, John 10, 10. The question that challenged me this week is this. Is the way I express my pro-life ethic consistent with the Bible? Is my pro-life ethic rooted in seeing women come to know Jesus? Or is it rooted in condemnation? Do our pro-life bumper stickers in church draw people to Jesus or push them away? That's a profound question. Which leads us to our second point. How are we to engage them? What are we to do? If, if the biblical view of life is that life is so special, so unique, so beautiful, across the spectrum, cradle to grave, how do we engage in a hyper-abortive age? How do we engage? What are we to do? And again, we're, we're not going to look to the politics of the day. We're not going to look to that. We're going to look to scriptures. We're going to look to Jesus and see how Jesus dealt with sinners, sinfulness, pagan, and religious people. We're going to look to Jesus. Say, Jesus, what did you do? So turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. 
We're going to pick up in verse 53. Um, some Bibles will break this passage out and will actually make John 7, 53 be John 8, 1. You'll see what I mean. If you go to your Bible, go to John chapter 8, you, you should see verse 53 right there in the beginning. We get this interesting encounter with Jesus. We're asking this question, how are we to engage a hostile culture? John writes in his gospel of this. They went each to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in their midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Verse 7, as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to him, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, Sin no more. Powerful text, huh? Wild text. We encounter several characters in John chapter 7, here in John 8. We, we encounter Jesus. We encounter all the people that are listening to him. We encounter the scribes and the Pharisees. And then we encounter this woman caught in adultery. We're going to examine them as we walk through the text. So in verse 1, verse 2 of chapter 8, we, we see that early in the morning he comes to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman. We, we see Jesus, he comes to the temple. It's, it's common practice for any rabbi to go to the temple and go and teach. For our context, he's preaching a sermon in a church. Jesus goes to the church in town, and he's preaching a sermon. What we don't know, we don't know his message. We don't know what Jesus was preaching, but here's what we do see. We do know who the crowd was. We know who was there, and we also knew who wasn't there. <clears throat> Notice in verse 2 what it says. Jesus is in the temple, he's teaching, he's preaching a sermon. In verse 2 it says, all the people came to him. And then notice in verse 3, the scribes and Pharisees arrive, meaning this, that the group that surrounded Jesus wasn't the typical religious crowd. The, the stodgy religious people, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, they weren't present. They're going to show up in a moment, but they're not there right now. The people present for Jesus' teaching, they weren't your stereotypical moral religious bunch. They weren't there yet. They're going to come. They're going to show up. I remind you of Luke 15, 1, where it talks about the, the sinners coming to Jesus. The people, all the people. That word's very powerful. All sorts of common, everyday, pagan, sinful people were attracted to Jesus. They wanted to come to Jesus. They wanted to know what Jesus was about. They wanted in on the offer of freedom from oppression that Jesus was talking about. And it's intentional that John brings our eyes to that, that all the people came to him. Because we have to see that it's broken and busted people who need Jesus. That's why they come to Jesus. Jesus says that in Mark chapter 2, verse 17. I didn't come to heal the sick, to heal the healthy. I came to heal the sick. 
That Jesus came for the broken people. It's for people like me, scruffy, dope, smoking Travis, that Jesus came. That was before I started working at Baptist Fellowship. Um, long, long time before. But it was for broken people that Jesus came. So imagine this. Jesus preaching a sermon. He's surrounded by everyday, common, messy people. And then a commotion ensues. Imagine, right here. Here we are. We're in church. We're preaching. And all of a sudden, those doors fling open. And in step the religious people. Here they come. Verse 3. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Notice, notice what's happening. These are the religious people showing up with this woman. The, these are the Jews. These are the people through whom blessing was to come to the nations. These are the people through whom God would reach the fallen and the broken. These are God's people. And instead of being blessings, they become these stodgy legalists. They're preoccupied with the fallenness and sinfulness of the world around them. They're preoccupied with themselves and how morally superior they are. And they drag this woman into the temple. They're all excited. And it's not just any woman they bring in. They bring in a woman who's caught in the act of adultery. Let that hit you. She was caught in the act of it. Dragged into the church. They're thinking, aha, we, we got her. We got the sinner. We got her, they say. And they put her on display. We read that in verse 3. They place her in the midst. They bring her right up front. They're all excited. Imagine now being this woman. Imagine your secret tryst is now on display. The world has already viewed you with contempt. And the only hope you have is the forgiveness of God. And it's his people that are making such a spectacle. Imagine her tears. Imagine her fears. Imagine her confusion. Of the place where she could come for healing, she's dragged in and thrown down on the floor and made a spectacle of. Verse 4 and 5, John 8. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Verse 5. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? So as is typical with stodgy, dusty, religious people, they cherry-pick a verse to suit their argument. So here they go. They got her. I've got my verse. I'm armed to bring her down. And they're not wrong in their assertion. They're right. They caught her in the act of adultery. They're right. The law of Moses, Deuteronomy 22, it says a woman should be punished for that. But you know what else it says? The man as well. Where's the man? Where's the man? They just brought her. They didn't care about fidelity to God's word. They didn't care about the Bible. They didn't care about the law. They just cared about being right. And they couldn't care less about this woman. They wanted to pad their egos. There's no concern for her. There's no listening. Typical of stodgy, dusty, religious people. See it right here. They were just interested in using the woman to prove Jesus wrong and to showcase how intelligent and moral they were. But then they ask a good question. They ask a very good question in the end of verse 5. They say, so what do you say? So what do you say, Jesus? It's a very good question, a question we should be asking daily and moment by moment. What does Jesus have to say? Imagine how different our lives would be if we asked that question. Jesus, what do you say about this situation? Jesus, what do you say about a culture immersed in crazy, super left politics where the butcher of babies is okay? Jesus, what do you say? How do you interact, Jesus? What should we do? Great question. Verse 6. They, then they, they said this to test him. That they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bends down and writes and wrote with his finger on the ground. It's interesting. You can almost sense the eye rolling of Jesus here. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, guys, this is what you're concerned about. And this is the way that you're going to fix it. What a way to introduce someone to church and Jesus. Tim, we should do that. We should rally up a bus 
and go to town. Let's just drag him right in. Throw him right down. I can just imagine Jesus here like, what? And then verse 7. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to him, said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone. In one sentence, Jesus confronts their self-righteousness and he cuts it off right at the root. Cuts it right off. As if Jesus is saying, if you want to play it that way, then let's play it that way. You want, you want to go there? You want, you want to start measuring each other now? Let's do it. And again, they're not wrong in their assessment. She, she was a sinner. She was in need of repentance. But Jesus makes the point, so were they. And they refused to repent of their own sin. Verse 9. Jesus answers them. And in verse 8, it says, And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. In verse 9, But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older one. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Fascinating. They, they leave like the cowards they were, with their tails between their legs. But notice something that comes out here in verse 9. This wasn't a group of young, inexperienced scribes and Pharisees. You see what the text says? This is beginning with the older ones. Jesus brings to our mind that age has no bearing on spiritual maturity. Here we see old saints misapplying scripture, questioning Jesus, and ready to murder a woman. Fascinating. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? All eyes are on Jesus now. What, what would Jesus do? What would he say? Imagine this commotion happening right here. The scribes and Pharisees leave. You're all here still. Jesus is up here. We're all kind of looking at each other like, that was weird. All eyes on Jesus now. Jesus, what are you, you going to say? What, what is Jesus going to say to her? Here Jesus is, face to face with a sinner. Face to face with one participating in an act that he would eventually die on the cross for. Here he is. The Son of God. God in flesh. The second member of the Trinity. And here she is. The home wrecker. The sinner. What would Jesus say? Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Jesus, he, he answers her, he addresses her respectfully. Woman, it just it means ma'am or miss or madam. It's a very sensitive term. He looks at her. Ma'am, where are they? He asks her these two powerful questions. Where are they? Where are those dudes who are accusing you? Where are those stodgy, dusty religious people? Where are they? And I could just imagine this woman, head hung in shame, and eyes puffed with tears, taking a glance up and around her, and realizing they were gone. Powerful moment for her. She was put on display as the penultimate sinner in front of the entire congregation. She was viewed and portrayed as the worst of the worst, the men said. And Jesus leveled the playing field between them and her. Where are they? In the face of Jesus, she wasn't any better or worse than the scribes and Pharisees, and the scribes and Pharisees weren't any better or worse than she. Powerful. And then he finishes. He says, has no one condemned you? Woman, has, has no one stoned you? In verse 11, she answers, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn Go, and from now on, sin no more. In the face of her shame and guilt, Jesus proclaims to her a message of hope. In the face of her deserving condemnation, she was a sinner. She committed adultery. She's a sinner. She meets the one who would take her condemnation and give her blessing. Those stodgy, dusty religious people, they wanted to parade her in front of the church and throw her down on the floor to condemn her. And Jesus gently looks her in the eye and maybe puts a hand beneath her chin and says, I don't condemn you. Go 
dry your eyes and repent. This woman was probably certain that this day would be her last. Her sin had found her out, and the religious people loved to point fingers at her. She was guilty, and everyone knew it. The religious people, they're, they're so arrogant and self-righteous in this, and they're so excited about being proven right in ministering to this woman. And in the midst of this horror, she encounters Jesus with a message of forgiveness and repentance. She encounters the mercy and grace of Jesus. She encounters the liberation of repentance. You see it here in the text. What a way to treat unbelievers. Imagine if we treated unbelievers in this way. Imagine if we treated those pushing for and pushing forth an, the agenda of abortion. Imagine if we could figure out a way to view them and treat them this way. So how are we to respond to a culture immersed in for an abortion? Pickets? Marches? Bumper stickers? Lobbying? Our hearts should go out to those 14 women in the Randolph community that will choose to abort their babies this year. Let that hit you. Our hearts should go out to them. They are not our enemies. And we have to ask this question, is Baptist Fellowship a place where they can come in their time of need? My heart breaks for the 14 women who aborted their babies last year. Is Baptist Fellowship portraying the scribes and Pharisees to them? Yelling, pointing, calling out, calling them murderers? Or is Baptist Fellowship portraying Jesus to them? Is our message there is grace and mercy and forgiveness in Jesus? My prayer is that we would leave the idol of politics behind and that we would set forth the word of God and the example of Jesus, that we would become consistently pro-life, that we would become cradle-to-grave pro-life, and that our hearts would grieve for the slaughter of babies in the womb, and that our hearts would grieve for the fear, the sadness, and the hopelessness of the mommies and daddies. And that we would show them Jesus. Amen? That's a good word. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word doesn't just encourage, it doesn't just comfort, but it also challenges, it also sands off the rough spots, that it, that it brings us to a place where we can see you clearly, see maybe where we don't quite add up and, and repent of areas that need to be repented in and rejoice in areas that we should rejoice in. Father, would you teach us to be professional lovers of humanity? Would you teach us to keep the gospel ever in front of our eyes? Would you teach us to not settle, settle for a political answer, but to settle for the true answer, the gospel of Jesus? Lord, we love you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, at this time, we'll take a moment.